hello everyone. Um, my name is Harry. I am a content designer. Um, I also work for Opencast along with Millie. Um, I've only been at Opencast for a few months. Um, prior to that, I was a content designer at Accenture, during which time I was spent the whole time working um, on HMRC, working on a range of different projects, um, which is my kind of main experience and knowledge of working within government digital service. Um, yeah, it's about sort of a year and a half, worked on a few different projects um, around customs, Brexit, COVID, all the big stuff. Um, so whilst I feel like I've got a pretty good idea of it all and hopefully can share some kind of personal insights of applying this, I wouldn't class myself as an expert on government design, um, but I feel like I've got a pretty good feel for it and, you know, hopefully can share that experience and that knowledge. Um, for me, content design is basically just about ensuring people get the right information at the right time. Um, and in the most understandable format. And that's really kind of what kind of is at the core of, of public sector design, government design. Um, these kind of the principles I'll talk about in GDS, these are kind of general like design principles. They're not necessarily specifically just about content. Um, I will obviously, you know, giving kind of examples that sort of relate to more to content as my own experience. Um, but generally, obviously, for me, you know, content is part of user centered design and it overlaps with. Um, you know, UX and UI and uh, user research and service design, it's all, you know, we're all part of the kind of the same thing of user centered design and these are essentially what these principles are about. Um, so just like a quick intro to GDS, Government Digital Service, um, it was formed in April 2011 uh, to implement the digital by default strategy, um, which was proposed by a report uh, made by the Cabinet Office. Um, snappily titled Direct Gov 2010 and Beyond, Revolution, Not Evolution, um, which is, you know, lots of meaningless words. But um, ultimately, the point was, is that prior to that point, um, government's sort of online presence was um, very bifurcated, very disparate, um, different styles, different user experiences, different ways of doing things. Nothing was kind of unified. Um, and the way you engaged with government online had no kind of consistent uh, principles guiding it. Um, so their kind of overarching aim of, of GDS is to build platforms, products, and services that help create a simple, joined up, and personalized experience of government to everyone. Um, so that kind of mostly focuses around GovUK. It's where we access all the times we might engage with um, the government. So the aim of GovUK was to take hundreds of websites down to one continual seamless user experience, um, which is kind of agnostic, as they say, but regardless of kind of which government department you're dealing with. Um, and it's a website that sees millions of users a week. And basically, the user base is essentially anyone who wants to or not literally wants to, but has to interact with government, which at some point or other is pretty much all of us. Um, so if I take you back to the wonderful world of mid noughties uh, web design, it's what Derek Gov used to look like, sort of gave the illusion that it was uh, kind of all in one place, but really behind each of these would be you know, any varying different sort of style, feel, look, experience, interaction, um, and very quickly you would lose any sense of kind of a seamless experience. Um, so when GovUK was first introduced, um, it was very well received. Um, it, was, it won the uh, design award for that year. So it was going up against things like the Shard and the Olympic Cauldron, um, which I guess you would regard as, you know, maybe the public would regard as more kind of obvious examples of, you know, impressive or good design. And, you know, what's essentially quite a sort of plain, simple looking website, I think, gave the illusion of being, oh, well, that's why is this very basic website um, getting this design award? But the point was is that it belied the huge amount of effort that had gone in to making it such. Um, so, you know, what you'll see is that if you're you know, interacting with a Gov website, it'll have this consistent design and look and feel. So on the left, we're dealing with the HM Passport Office, um, which is one, you know, one department within the government. Um, and then on the right, we're dealing with HMRC, two completely different services, which both look and feel and behave in a very consistent way. So how does this come about? Um, basically, anyone who's working within government services, so whether that's someone who's working directly for any of these agencies, or someone like myself who coming in as, as, a, as a contractor, um, there are these 10 principles which were kind of ordained early on in the GovUK process uh, and kind of speak to all the, the ways in which you have to work when you're working within GDS. 
Um, some of these, you know, will probably be familiar to some of you. I mean, I obviously don't know everyone's experiences. Some of you might have worked in government or public sector. Um, and some of this might be, you know, teaching you things you already know, um, but hopefully it kind of reinforces those things. Uh, and there are some nuggets of interesting information amongst it. Um, so the first principle, kind of the most obvious and one we should, you know, kind of hopefully will be familiar with if we're if we work within design is uh, starting with user needs. Um, so, you know, if you don't know what the user needs are, you won't build the right thing. And um, obviously what often happens, especially when we're working within public sector is your stakeholders will say, oh, we need this, when actually your users are saying something completely different. So you really need to do that research and advocate for doing that. Um, I'm not gonna get into, you know, stakeholder management. That's a whole extra uh, different talk that someone could give. Um, but I think the most important thing is getting that kind of buy-in to the process of, of starting with these user needs, really not accepting any assumptions that have been made, but also at the same time, recognizing that, you know, the stakeholders you do work with, sponsors, whoever they may be, clients, they'll often be, and especially within government, they will be subject matter experts. So from working within HMRC, these are people who, you know, HMRC tax is a complicated world and they know it inside out. The problem is, is that whilst that information is super useful and really important to, to understand when you're coming in as a, as a designer, um, it's also the case that they will not realize how little like users might know. So it's always important to obviously not make assumptions. Um, and again, I'm not gonna go into lots of user research methods. I am not a user researcher. Um, I work with them and they're fantastic. Um, I won't get into, again, this is a different talk, um, but you know, any kind of way you, you, you gather information you know, speaking to people, data, which we'll talk about a little bit more, um, you know, affinity mapping, et cetera, et cetera. As long as you know what your user needs are and not what their wants are, um, you'll hopefully build the right thing. Um, often a quote that gets kind of trotted out when people talk about this is, is one about Henry Ford asking, you know, if, if he'd asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. Um, and it gets the point across is that, you know, people won't necessarily know what they need, what they actually need. Um, but Henry Ford was a, a terrible person and he didn't actually say that. So just, just FYI. Um, the second principle is doing less. And that doesn't mean half-assing it. Um, that means a couple of things. First, in, within government, it means government should only do what government can do. Shouldn't be trying to do anything else. Um, essentially, you know, when you go to the Gov website, you want to be doing one really, usually one really specific thing and nothing else. Um, you know, it might be different if you're writing content for kind of e-commerce where, you know, you're trying to retain people, you're trying to drive conversion. Um, you know, someone buys a product, you suggest a similar product for your content and your UX, but it's not like you go onto the website and you're paying your car tax and it's like, are you also interested in registering a death? Like, it's not, you know, not going to be the case with government. You're doing the one thing and that's what you should be in there and be able to do without any distraction. And it also means not uh, replicating um, effort that's been done. So the advantage of this kind of consistent look and feel is that whilst every service is different and has its own specific like user needs and way it will be built, ultimately the sort of building blocks should all be roughly the same. Ultimately, most services for government are asking for bits of information about you or providing, trying to provide evidence or trying to find out about you so you can get the right service you need. And ultimately, there's only a few real kind of ways you might interact with people doing that. Um, so within GDS, there is a very thorough and I found quite good to work with and design system. Um, this is all publicly available. You can look through it. Um, every single one of these patterns has been sort of thoroughly tested, usability tested, accessibility tested. Um, each component has uh, like a chat history and a GitHub repo all publicly accessible, all open source. Um, so even if you're not necessarily specifically working within government, if you're doing design that is for, you know, basically everyone, they're really good ways of kind of looking at your, looking at how government has solved this and how it's, you know, it's not just one person so fixing it this year, you know, these are group efforts. These are people trying them out, finding out what's good, what's bad, and also recognizing that things could be improved. Um, every one of these patterns is is basically you know a living thing. It can be refined and changed. Um, but basically, you know, you don't need to start from scratch every single time. And that's quite a valuable asset when 
I found when I'm working on services, um, working with, you know, UX designer, um, we don't have to, you know, we can take some things as written as like, oh, well, we'll, you know, we can have radios, we can have checkboxes and stuff, and we don't have to waste time, you know, with the UX designer doesn't have to waste time doing, you know, unique CSS. And the content designer needs to, doesn't need to think, oh, how do we ask this question? Because it's already been asked, you know, a hundred different times and a hundred different services. Um, so we never, you know, start from scratch. Um, the third principle is designing with data. Um, so same as these components are never finished, ultimately a service is never complete, it's never done, it's never perfect. These things are always iteratable, if that's a word. Um, and one way we can do that is designing with data. Um, so letting kind of data drive decisions, not kind of hunches or guesswork. Um, that and data isn't just numbers on the screen, it's also qualitative data. So it's talking to people, it's doing user research, getting insights. Often user research gets kind of an impression that it's sort of a nice to have. And I'm sure anyone who's worked kind of within any kind of uh, kind of design or service design has, has probably experienced that. But user research is so invaluable. And I mean, as a content designer, you could obviously, you know, you try and have empathy for your users, you, know, you take in user needs, you try and write the content as best you can. And you can probably think, oh, I've done a pretty good job there. And then you put it in front of people and, you know, nine out of 10 people haven't got a clear what you're talking about. So getting that validation is so, so important. And I'm sure a lot of you will know that anyway, but trying to advocate for that is also is sometimes a challenge. Um, again, sort of getting into stakeholder management, but if you can get like stakeholders actually invested in that process and involved, if, even if it's a case of just having a stakeholder like, you know, observe on a user research session, hearing it kind of from the horse's mouth, as it were, can be quite a powerful thing. Um, rather than it constantly coming through the prism of, you know, oh, well, we've made this change as a design team. Um, if you kind of get that involvement and that buy-in, that can really help. And if you've got, you know, got hard data, you've got direct quotes from people, you can kind of illustrate those points. Um, an example I worked on uh, whilst at HMRC was the uh, HMRC Digital Assistant chatbot. Um, it was, I will say, honestly, imperfect. Um, it was kind of being developed and then it got rapidly sort of um, fast-tracked to deal with um, primarily the coronavirus support schemes that were being run by HMRC, so job retention scheme, furlough scheme, um, and the self-income, self-employed income support scheme, the main ones. And, you know, their existing contact channels, their um, you know, phone and web chat, we're seeing massive upticks in, in people, you know, not understanding what, how much they were going to get, how to sign up for it. These are obviously completely new schemes and they were kind of, you know, the policy for them was changing every minute. Um, so it was challenging for the content designers who were working on the guidance to, you know, stay up to date with all these changes. And naturally, you know, things become confused and people asking questions. But a lot of those questions um, were, you know, what you would call low value and not that they weren't important to those people and they weren't valuable answers that they needed. But the point was that the information that the advisor on the phone or the web chat could give was basically just in the guidance. You know, the person just hadn't been able to find it or the guidance wasn't well structured or well written. Um, so ultimately, we're trying to sell, allow people to self-serve using this chatbot. But the problem with the chatbot is that it is not that intelligent and you are basically basing a lot of things on assumptions. So we assume, okay, there's going to be, you know, the third self-employed grant is coming through. We're going to, these are this, this and this is being changed in terms of the criteria for it. So we're going to expect people to ask questions about this. And we would try and write some content around that. Uh, but then when we actually looked through the chat logs, which was often quite a kind of <laughs> slightly harrowing experience, you realize how, you know, it, where it was falling short. And when it's a chatbot, people just get annoyed and then they want to talk to a person. So ultimately we're not achieving the aim we wanted to do, which was to help self people self-serve and not, you know, create backlogs of queues on the phone and on the web chat. But as hard as it was to look through those things, it was obviously a really powerful way of iterating and improving, going, okay, we, people are asking this question loads and loads of times. We don't have an answer. The chatbot's just saying, I don't understand. And you're just frustrating people more than they already are. Um, so the data there was super important and super powerful in terms of kind of refining that experience of the user. Um, fourth principle is doing the hard work to make it simple. So what you'll often hear, often working within government is, oh, well, that's just always how we've done it. 
Um, and that is often, often quite a difficult thing to counter. Um, but just obviously because something's always been done away doesn't mean it should continue to be done that way. And often can, what can happen, especially with, with public service work, is you have a legacy process, something that's been, you know, on a maybe a post postal form for 10 years or more longer. Um, and the kind of inclination from government, you know, would be the simplest thing, which would be to just kind of uh, lift and shift, as it were, the content or the experience from that form into a digital form. When actually, when you do your actual user research and your user insights, you find that most of the information that's being asked for in that form is, is irrelevant. So you've got kind of GDPR issues there of us, you know, accruing all this unnecessary information about people. It could be that the service itself is completely kind of out of date and the service itself needs rethinking, not just the way people apply to it. Um, and all of that takes work and it's hard and it can be a bit of an uphill battle and you're trying to get buy-in for the kind of user-centered process. And often what can come out at the end of it, much like the GovUK website itself, is something that's sort of deceptively simple, um, something that belies the kind of complexity that went into getting it to that level of simplicity. Um, and I think it's often quite hard, and I found this from my own kind of design experience of when I did my design masters, which was more broader kind of industrial design course, you would see someone who'd already spent six months on a project and it would be this perfect, brilliant thing. You'd be like, how did you ever get to that? And that's because they spent six months tearing the damn hair out, trying to get to the right thing. So ultimately it is always worth putting in the effort and trying to convince people that, as I say, just because something's always been done a certain way doesn't mean it should continue to be that way. Um, the fifth principle is kind of already been touched on really, which is about iterating and taking in the principles we already talked about and then doing them again. Um, you know, releasing a minimum viable product, uh, testing with actual users, moving through your phases. So if any of you've worked within GDS, there are kind of very kind of clearly defined uh, phases of discovery, alpha, private beta, public beta, live. Um, they can be varying in length and quality, really depends on the operational buying you're getting, the people you've got in your team, Hopefully you've got, you know, a full, full team of, uh, of UCD people. Um, but also it's about <clears throat> recognizing that sometimes you'll have to add things, sometimes you have to remove things. Sometimes you'll have edge cases and often have edge cases with government design because you've got such a large user base for all your services. And often it's the edge cases that take up the most time and the most effort. And it's quite easy to kind of think, ah, oh, it's not worth the effort. It is obviously worth the effort because you want to make sure it's a service that works for everyone but often it might be the case if you have to accept that in the initial release you know there might be some unhappy paths for people but get that minimum viable product out there continue to work on those more tricky unhappy paths and get those resolved um and from a content point of view i've, I've got another example um of a project i worked on which was um for customs so when you travel through <laughs> when we used to travel um around the world um, when you're going back through the airport, there's the red or green channel um, or the blue channel before we left the EU, um, which was, you know, I have nothing to declare or red, I have things to declare. I don't know about you. I've literally never been through the goes to declare channel, but I'm also not much of a, a shopper. Um, but technically, if you have certain goods over certain allowances, you should declare them. Um, and this service was giving a, uh, a digital alternative to that. So you could do it beforehand. Um, so you wouldn't have to waste time in the airport. Um, it was a kind of a, a trust-based service, so not a massive amount of uptake and very challenging for user research because we were doing it whilst there was travel ban and we couldn't, you know, in an ideal world, you would have just gone, we would have gone to an airport, you know, talked to people in situ, asked them about what they knew about their allowances, et cetera. So all of that wasn't possible. We were also, the reason the service was, was, Accelerated was because of the impending Brexit deadline when we we're working on it in 2020. Um, and the guidelines and the allowances were changing all the time because of the negotiations for Brexit. So we were constantly working with kind of shifting sand where what was required of the service was changing all the time. And if anyone who's worked on anything that's been impacted by Brexit will, will know the pain of that. Um, but my point about this is. Sometimes content design isn't necessarily about changing the words, it's about changing the kind of order of the words and the way you interact with them. Um, so as part of the service, we needed to ask kind of where you were bringing goods from. 
initially this was quite a simple page and then we had to add all these little caveats saying oh actually the canary islands isn't part of the eu even though spain is and then we had to have a, a great britain to northern ireland journey because that was separate because of the soft border whole can of worms but ultimately we kept adding more and more content to the page that was sort of needed to be there but from the user research we were getting through people were sort of losing track of what the question was by the time they got to the interaction point which is these three radio buttons so from your question to your actual answer your interaction point people were losing context um but we kind of needed the information there so we changed it by basically reordering the content so that the information was there contextually where you interacted with it and was only kind of necessary for people to read if they needed it so you know I might be coming from France and I know full well that France is in the EU so I'll you know, just click a few countries without having to look through the list but I might be in you know Lithuania and not necessarily be 100% sure whether they are in the EU or not um so and that tested a lot better when we tried it out so the point was you know between these two pages the content is almost identical but just by you know shifting things around and this is where I think you know UX and content design are very much you know they overlap very solidly they are kind of two parts of the same thing um but yeah the point is is that by iterating that not necessarily by changing the words we completely change the user experience um next principle and the one that kind of feeds into the one after as well is that this is for everyone so as i said basically everyone at some point in their lives will have to interact with government in some form unless they live in the woods um and obviously we therefore need to make our services accessible but i don't really like the word accessible um i think accessibility you know obviously it's come on massively in terms of you know people actually considering it as a cornerstone of design rather than as a nice to have at the end of it but i think the problem with still calling it accessibility or accessible or is it accessible it still gives it this sense of kind of an other or an addition or a you know oh yeah got to make it accessible I think the better word, and I think it's a, lot, a word a lot of people are using more, is inclusive. So inclusive design. So if you're thinking about everyone from the beginning, then you're all by nature, by the nature of it, make something that is legible, readable, etc. The things that make things inclusive. But if you just think about, okay, who are users? Literally everyone. You will design a service that works for everyone. It won't be an afterthought. Um, and the thing is, with government, is often the case that the people who need government services the most. Are the people who find them hardest to use, who have the most barriers to entry. Um, so that sort of also plays into the next one, which is about understanding context. So, you know, we are designing for people, not for specific devices. Um, obviously, you need to think about the device people are likely to use. Um, but the point is, is that our environment and our circumstances and our context can, for want of a better word, kind of disable all of us. Um, you know, the point is, is that if you've got a building which doesn't have a ramp on it and i'm someone who uses a wheelchair i am not being i'm not disabled inherently i'm being disabled by the design of that building there's an ability for people who are able-bodied and people who use mobility aids to get into a building then it's good design it's good for everyone i'm not being disabled by my environment so these plays plays into an idea called universal barriers which might be something you're familiar with um which I will just hopefully quickly zip through without boring everyone to tears. Um, but these are essentially ideas that there are different things in, in our lives um, that make give barriers to all of us to, to interact. And so I'm going to talk specifically about government design, but these can be applied to basically any design you might do. Um, so the first one is emotional state. Um, so <laughs> I think I speak for everyone, the last two years have been trying um and you know we're all a bit fried and we're all a bit you know shuttered and weird because we've all been sitting inside for two years and our you know desire and our feelings when we're engaging with something that we have to do and often working with you know engaging with the government service is something you have to do because you have to not because you want to your emotional state will affect your ability to you know understand instructions to do things correctly in the correct order um so in terms of content is making sure that nothing you're doing is putting that kind of cognitive load on someone that's already you know in a difficult place with their mental health um enthusiasm is kind of tied in and also these barriers they all kind of overlap and interact they're not discrete things 
Um, you'll have some, depending on your service and your users, that will be more prevalent than others, depending on what it is you're asking the user to do. Um, but ultimately, so for enthusiasm, you know, people might just, I mean, especially having worked with an HMRC, a lot of people don't want to pay tax, which is often kind of fair enough. People who are struggling, you know, you, you really don't want to have to pay more than you have to. Um, but also, you know, it can be a case of you just, you don't want to do it. You don't want to do it. So you're already coming up against, you know, a, will, an, a lack of willingness to, to engage. I think the sort of, there's kind of an attend, attend, you tend to sort of design for your like ideal user when you're designing a service that someone who's, you know, super excited and super interested in, in you know, I don't know, renewing the tax on the car when really it's a it's an obligation, it's something we have to do. So you're kind of fighting against that. So again, it, that encourages you to design something that is as painless as possible. And I think that's kind of a key phrase. And when people ask me what I do, I'm like, I just try and make your life a little bit less painful. Um, interface and interaction skills. So these are things which you may be more kind of traditionally class when you're thinking about inclusive design accessibility. You know, um, people who have different um, ability, uh, ability abilities, um, who have maybe partially sighted or um, have hearing problems. Um, you know, obviously we want to make sure that none of that is a barrier to entry and a barrier to engage with your service. I mean, that's pretty fundamental. You don't want to stop anyone being able to use a service, but it might also be the case that, you know, sometimes even when you're working on digital service, it will interact with the real world. And I'll talk a little bit about that in the next principle. Um, but, you know, if something requires someone to literally go somewhere and interact with something that we need to consider, some people might not be able to do that. Um, finance. So this can be, you know, not being able to afford access to the internet, um, not having access to a phone or a laptop. Um, so if your only channel is digital, then you're excluding people who, you know, need to use the phone because they can't afford that. But it's also um, around kind of fees and fines. Does your service incur a fee if some people, if someone isn't able to do that? And this is where like these other barriers will come in. So if for, you know, reasons of mental health, there's someone has not been able to fill in the form on the deadline, you're then slapping them with a fine because they weren't able to do it on time, but they had these extenuating circumstances. And this obviously goes a bit beyond content. It's like how the service works and, and kind of the fundamentals behind it, but we need to consider them. I think often these can be, some of these things can be overlooked. Again, we kind of designed for this like idealized user, which doesn't exist. Um, then we have access, which is kind of similar is, you know, do they have access to, um, to technology? Do they have access physically to where they need to go to pick up the, you know, their prescription say, whatever it might be? Um, you know, is that gonna be a barrier to people being able to successfully complete um, your service, go through your journeys. Um, Self-confidence. Um, often it's the case with uh, government design is that, government services, sorry, is that often uh, a lot of your users will be first time users. They're not people who do this every day. It's something they haven't had to deal with before. So whether that's say, you know, falling on, falling on you know, into hard times and is, is gonna be on universal credit for the first time, something they've never had to engage with and they might not have the ability or confidence. It might be that they're, they're 18 and it's the first time they've had to pay tax. I have an absolutely no idea because we are terrible at teaching anyone about tax at school. Genuinely think there should just be a subject at school about, you know, real world things, tax, etc. Um, so, you know, your confidence with what's being asked of you. So that can be kind of making assumptions about the knowledge that your users have, um, never assuming people know anything and not in a bad way, but just you shouldn't assume anyone has you know, knowledge, pre, pre gained knowledge about something. Um, so in terms of the content, it's making sure you're never assuming that you're always introducing something. You're not even something like HMRC, people might know what that means or who they are. Um, so it's kind of about that kind of lack of assuming someone already knows what they need to do. Um, time, this is kind of a big one. Uh, people are time poor. They don't have time to be sitting, reading reams and reams of information or understand what they're doing. Um, and for me, as a, as a content designer, I feel my like, for me, sign of kind of, I've done a good job is if someone doesn't have to read something twice. And um, if I think someone has to read an instruction or, or you know, a question or a piece of content more than once, then I haven't made it clear enough. I haven't made it concise and simple enough. Um, you want to respect people's time 
you know, you shouldn't expect people to have to sit on a service for half an hour. And also, you know, these other factors come into play because maybe I've only got, maybe I'm an internet cafe and I've only got 10 minutes, for example. Um, trust. Depends who you're working for, but some people trust the government more than others, um, different areas of the government more than others. Um, obviously, trust in the government is being steadily eroded at the moment. Um, so people's, people's trust is, is often something you're coming up against. Um, if they're having to provide, say, personal documents, you know, how do you instill a sense of kind of security? Obviously, part of that will come from the kind of technical side, making sure things are secure. But from a design and content point of view, you know, are you making it, are you making people feel that they can kind of trust you? The, the difficult thing here is that the kind of the style, there's a, there is obviously kind of established style, and that's again, another presentation um, within of writing for government, but it tends to be quite kind of imperative and straight ahead. It's just do this, don't do this, ask this, give this, send this. It's not, oh, please, can you do this? Please, we don't really say kind of please and thank you writing in government. Um, which often people don't mind, they don't need that. They just wanna to be told what they need to do. But there's a case of kind of understanding your context. Um, often, obviously with the government services, some of them are, you know, sensitive subjects, whether that's child support or, um, you know, disability benefits, you know, you're dealing with people who are in, you know, difficult situations and their engagement with these services is really important. And you can, it is a turning to thing and I'm, feel free to ask me questions about this afterwards because I don't have an answer necessarily for how to do it well kind of staying within that style and if anyone was at the previous content folks about kind of tone of voice it can sometimes be a challenging thing so working on a service which was to do with uh, like well whistleblowing basically people reporting fraud um and kind of the feedback we were getting from user research was that you know oh i'd kind of like to feel like thanked for you know basically for one of a word you know dobbing in someone um but we can't be so like, oh, thanks for doing that, because it might be the case of what the information they've given is, is not worth anything. And actually, you can't investigate it. So we can't really assume anything. But can you at least show kind of some gratitude in the way that you phrase and, and pose your questions? So trying to instill that trust can be challenging. I think it, you might, it, it really depends on kind of the service you're working on and, and what people feel. But you'll only find out what that is by doing, you know, user research at the beginning. Um, comprehension skills. So uh, with government, we, we write to a reading age of nine. Um, and that isn't particularly because that is the average reading age. I don't know what the average reading age in this country is, but the point of that nine-year-old uh, age is by the time we're nine, um, we stop reading the, well, I say we, people who, you know, are don't have a necessarily have any specific difficulties around comprehension, dyslexia, etc. So even that is not necessarily an inclusive way of saying things, but ultimately most, you know, the majority of people um, stop reading the 5,000 most common words uh, and you kind of start reckoning them, recognizing them by their shape rather than specifically reading them. And that's kind of how we read as we grow older, we kind of bounce around. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen like, if you could take the first and last letter of a word and jump up the, the other letters in between, most people can just read that without thinking it just because that's not the way our eyes and our brains work. But the point is the more of those 5,000 most common words you use, the less time and less effort it is for someone to read and the quicker and more easily it is to understand something. So the more you use those common words, um, the less cognitive load you're putting on the user and the more likely it is that they understand that instruction first time. Um, evidence. Um, so that might be you know, asking people for you know, documents, which they might not have. They might not have the ability to scan something in. They might not have access to it, they might not have a driving license, they might not have a passport, they might not have even a permanent address, which is often like the cornerstone of a lot of services you ask for their address, when actually, you know, people will not have those. So don't design your services in a way that requires those things. Or if, 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 you, if it is essential, what are the ways around it for those users who don't have access to that stuff? Um, and the last one is awareness. And this is often the case if you don't know a service exists until you need to interact with it. Um, you know, you've, you've never had to, I don't know, pay council tax. So you'll just Google council tax and then find a service, but you didn't know that service existed specifically. You assumed it would, you'd assume there'd be some mechanism by which you can do that. 
um, but it might be the case that people don't know if they need to do pay the council tax in the first place. So this is something that's maybe necessarily kind of out of your control, especially as a content designer. It. Um, you know, that could be working with comms, working with marketing, depends what it is, depends what the organization is you're working in. Um, but if someone doesn't know your service exists in the first place, then they're going to come on, come in with absolutely no knowledge. Um, so how do you allow for that? Um, to appreciate that is a, like quite a lot of information at once, um, but hopefully a lot of that kind of chimed with people. Um, again, it's called universal barriers. There's, there's stuff online. I didn't come up with these, um, but I do find them really effective. And sometimes it's good to think when you're looking at service, think, okay, maybe all of these might come in some ways, but maybe three of them are like the ones we're seeing a lot in our user research. So we kind of keep those in mind when we're thinking about like content strategy and the way we're writing, the way we're designing. Um, the eighth one is building digital services, not websites. Um, so this sort of plays into what I'm talking talk about before, as in, you know, your full user journey might not just be the digital service aspect of it. It might be, you know, the physical interaction. So whether that's something you physically receive in the post, like a passport, um, or in the instance of the service I was talking about, the one in, when you're going through an airport. So you could use the service to declare your goods. And the point was that you could just go through the green channel. But if you're walking through the airport with, you know, 10 Shivanshi bags on your way back from Dubai, Border Force might stop to ask if you've declared them. But if you have, you can show them on your mobile device. Um, so that's a physical interaction. So therefore, we had stakeholders we had to engage with. So the Border Force officers, we had to talk to them. Um, obviously, they are in the physical world. They exist. And um, so, you know, a digital service is often not the beginning and end of the user experience. It's a part of it. So understanding how it kind of interacts uh, and making sure from a content point of view that your content and the instructions you're giving people are consistent. So, you know, if a poster in the airport says one thing and then your service says something completely different, then obviously you've got to disconnect with people and you might have a lack of trust, et cetera, et cetera. Um, number nine is being consistent, not uniform. So basically following all those principles we already talked about and using like the design patterns helps you be consistent, but sometimes you might need to break from pattern. You might need, might have just a very specific user need or thing that they need to do or evidence they need to upload, whatever it may be. And you need to kind of break from that. And it's having the kind of ability to do that and the confidence to do that. Um, there are great communities of practice within government. Um, so if anyone who has worked within government, they'll know that especially within design, like often you are not the first person to hit a problem. Um, um, but if you are, then there'll be other people who can provide their expertise and information. Um, you know, it's just recognizing that every circumstance is different. And whilst we can, you know, work with patterns and, and share them, we can also talk about why they haven't worked. Um, so it, it's a subtle thing being consistent, not uniform. They could argue they sort of mean the same thing, but it's that subtlety of, of being consistent in your approach, but not necessarily uniform in the kind of output from that approach. And number 10, and I think sort of already been said is making things open because it makes things better. So that's sharing code, sharing design and sharing ideas, sharing failures, being honest when things haven't worked out. And I'm sure we've all seen news stories about services that haven't worked, um, track and trace, for example. Um, but basically the more eyes that are on a service generally, the better it gets. Um, you know, you can, I've, I've, been in crits and I enjoy being in crits because I enjoy being able to like look at a problem and think about it. But when you're the one being critted, it can be challenging. It can be quite like, oh shit, I didn't realize I completely missed the point. But that's because if you're working on a service that has maybe 30 screens, 30 questions, you'll have gone through those a hundred times and you can sort of often not see the wood for the trees. Um, and something that's really obvious, finally obvious to someone who's seeing it for the first time is something you just completely gloss over because you know, you've read it 300 times. So getting opinions, sharing things, being open, being honest um, is really, really powerful. So those are the principles. Hopefully that was useful. Um, I'd recommend going to the government page for this. This is basically where all that's come from. I, nothing I've said is original. Um, so yeah, it's guidance forward slash government design principles. Just generally, if it's not something you've ever looked at or had a poke around, I would recommend it if you're interested in, you know, good, simple public design. Um, and I would also recommend um, this book. So whoever it was, Dan, if you haven't bought it, you could use your book voucher on this. Um, Blue Down was part of the original Gov UK team. 
um, they are a very knowledgeable um, designer and they share lots of really good tips in the book um, lots of good examples lots of good effective ways of working and a lot of it obviously plays into uh, the principles that have been used for government um, so that is everything um, I don't well I do have Twitter but it's mostly I just use it to kind of complain to customer service Twitter accounts so if you want to connect I'm on LinkedIn not that I use LinkedIn much either but I'll figure out how to have something at the end. Um, so yeah, that's bit.ly slash Harry Thompson's. And that's all. Are there any questions?